Well then, <laughs> I'll say the old girl still got it, guys. Welcome back. This is Eric here with Iraq Veteran 8888. Today we've got another Millsurp uh, review for you. We're going to be showing you one from the uh, personal collection here. This is a uh, Argentine 1909 cavalry uh, carbine, short Mauser rifle. Uh, a lot of folks have been asking us to have a look at some of the uh, the old classics, especially in kind of the short configuration. Uh, you can see that this is one stumpy little devil, relatively short barrel. Uh, it's got the full length kind of stock going all the way up to a nose cap type configuration that you're going to see on a lot of these kind of manlicker style, uh, you know, rifles. Um, it does have this big gnarly front sight protector here uh, that helps uh, protect the front sight post. And I, I guess they assume as well with these types of rifles that they're going to get knocked around a lot. So that's probably one design feature that kind of gets played into with this type of uh, rifle. You've seen on the channel where we've shot the 1891 service rifle, uh, the 1891 Argentine, which is chambered in the same caliber, the 7.65 by 53 millimeter. Uh, the ammo we're running is loaded by PPU. It's a 174 grain uh, full metal jacket uh, bullet that we're running in this particular gun. You guys know that when the Mauser 98 came along, it was a humongously successful rifle for uh, the Mauser firm. And as a result, you know, lots of countries uh, went on to develop a Mauser, pa uh, Mauser pattern type uh, rifle. And this is no different. When you look at the side of the receiver, you know, it shows that it's made in Germany, uh, which I'm not going to attempt to even pronounce those words because I can't, can't pronounce them. But we see Mauser uh, Ma Modelo, not the, not the beer, but the model, I guess, Argentino 1909. So it's an M1909 uh, service carbine in 7.65 by 53. It's a bolt action. Uh, the way that the lugs, you've got two locking lugs that are forward opposed, and then you've got a safety lug right here that locks into the rear of the receiver. That's one thing that the original 1891 did not have. It only used uh, the two forward uh, locking lugs, so the Mauser 98 obviously being a stronger action. You know, Argentina, just like any other military back then, uh, wanted to have the most advanced gun that they could get a hold of and that they could arm their troops with. If you're clever, you may notice here, we also have a sword on the table. This would have been uh, an equally used and equally carried uh, weapon back then uh, during that time. This is, a, uh, this is an original cavalry uh, short sword uh, that would have been issued with uh, this rifle. And uh, these would have been used on horseback. They would have been used in, uh, in a lot of different cases. Now, this one's had the edge ground down. Uh, when they exported a lot of these uh, swords, you know, when they sent them abroad, they sold them off as surplus. Uh, they did several things. One thing, they removed the edge from the sword. I mean, you can see there's no edge. It's purely decorative at this point. Although an edge could be put on the sword. It could be sharpened, obviously. It is a German-made uh, sword which would have been, you know, typical. They, they would order the swords and the bayonets from Germany just like they would the uh, rifles back then. The Argentinian uh, crest has been ground off of the hilt of the sword. And there's also some words here that were on the sword. You can barely make out Argentino right there. You can see where they defaced and ground down all the Argentinian uh, markings off of the sword. That was common back then for them to do that because when they were selling this stuff off as of surplus, they didn't really know if it was going to be used in some type of a conflict by maybe another nation's army or something. So they didn't want to have their weapons fall into the hands of, let's just say, some other army and then them get involved in some type of a conflict. And then all of a sudden you're getting captured weapons with Argentinian markings on them. And people get the wrong idea. So I think that was kind of one of those things. They didn't want people getting the wrong idea. This, uh, Getting back to the 1909 carbine, this rifle does have an intact crest, uh, which is rare. Uh, a lot of these Argentinian guns that, that are that have especially ones that you know went in the United States, a lot of them have the scrubbed receivers, and that's not too uncommon to see that the receivers defaced on the guns. That is normal and and somewhat correct for uh, especially how they got to the United States in particular. This one does have an intact crest. Not all of them were defaced. This is one that was not. Uh, you see, we have a turn bolt, uh, which is nice. Uh, the 1909 full-size rifle, which we will do a video on as well if you want. I, I should have brought it to show you the size difference. This is definitely a shorter gun. You can see it utilizes a straight comb stock, which I'm a big fan of. I really like. Okay, 
and you can see that there's no provision for an infantry style sling mount. Uh, there are no sling studs on the bottom of the gun. The sling studs are on the left side of the firearm and it's meant to be carried cavalry style. So on horseback and everything like that. We're going to shoot the gun a little bit more and as a bonus we are going to take this gun out to 600 and uh, shoot it as well. We got a little bit of light rain going out here today but we're not going to let it stop us. Um, PPU in terms of ammunition is really about the only game in town for this unfortunately um, and it's kind of cool that that they load the ammo and everything like that. Um, some of these oddball cartridges guys you know there's just not a lot of support out there for them. So not a lot of companies are, you know, loading these types of cartridges. Uh, so the fact that you can buy the PPU is kind of nice. And the, the brass is boxer prime and reloadable, which is kind of handy. I mean, guys, I'm not trying to sell you on the ammo. I'm just saying that, especially for an oddball caliber like this, it's really about the only game in town that there is. We're going to take some more shots. It is raining. We don't care. All right. We're going to shoot. Well, I care because I'm covering the cameras up. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <coughs> All right. Hang on one sec. Okay. <clears throat> you gonna just take some random shots? Yeah, I can. All right. Hang on, let me make sure this bag isn't gonna fly in front of the lens. You good? <laughs> the things we do. All right. All right, we run him? Yeah, run it. <clears throat> All right, Chad, why don't you uh, call some shots for me and I'll just, I'll try to take whatever shot you call. Well, I think we're shooting pretty good up there at three. It was. You want me to see if I can hit the, what? Coyote? Let's see. You call it. Yeah, go ahead and aim for that coyote. Now, coyote. your first, like, two shots stacked within a few inches of each other, but they were a little slightly high and right on the gong, so. Well, you took out his, uh, his butthole. <laughs> well, it hit him hard. Let's try again. Right in the center of the target. Wow. Took out I mean, his guts. For, for a little stubby carbine, it shoots really good. It's good. Hey, why, don't you, uh, why don't you go for that half size D28 there above the coyote? All right. <clears throat> All right. Good elevation, just, just right off of three o'clock there. Yep. Yuck. <laughs> that thing's got loud, some power. Buddy. <laughs> All right. All right. Challenging shot, eight inch popper on the right. Eight inch popper with a cavalry carbine at 300 yards of open sights. Okay, no problem, no right? No pressure. No big deal. All right, I think you hit a little bit low in front of it. Hang on. I'll all right, 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 right. I was trying to fix my bag. <laughs> yeah, we are getting rained on, but we're not going to complain. We're not going to melt either, guys. So much for the forecast. So much for the forecast. But oh, you know funny. what? Speaking of coyotes, I was taking my son to school this morning, and there was a freaking coyote in the neighbor's yard. Nice. Dude. Okay. Eight-inch popper? Eight-inch popper. <laughs> Nothing but net. This thing is shooting exceptionally well, man. It really is. All right. So, same place, just down there in front of it, slightly low and left. Yep. <laughs> yes, right in the middle. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. We got to get this thing up the hill, man. All right, that, that was low again. All it's right, weird, I got like, one round left where you want it. Go for that eight inch popper gun. I'm just curious on the, you keeping the same point of aim? Yeah. All right. Uh, it's putting that, them right in there, though. Yeah, I mean, it was kind of in between your other two shots. Oh, wait, I got one more round. Well, what's weird is, like, some shots are going a little higher, and then it's like some of them are under power, and they're just hitting a little bit low. Huh. All right, I'm going to go for the 8-inch again. Go, yeah, go ahead and get one more time. Yeah, that was down there at the base again. Wow. Like, windage-wise, I mean, they're stacking right in there, but it's just the elevation. I don't, I don't know if it's something with the ammo. Maybe it's yeah. some of it's underpowered or whatever. One, I don't know. one thing that we have seen with some of the PPU offerings, guys, and uh, this is not just this particular caliber, but other calibers that they load, <coughs> is the, uh, the kind of shot-to-shot -shot consistency. Like he said, you know, sometimes we've seen some minor elevation differences, at, especially at longer ranges that we shoot at. 
Um, and I think that's just the nature of the ammo. I mean, guys, mm. it is reasonably P priced PPU. ammo. PPU. Poor yeah. performance and underpowered. Oh, it's not. It's not bad ammo for what it is. <laughs> it's um, good brass. But uh, do you want to shoot from up here or do you want to try up at the tower? I want to go for the gusto. You want to go for the gusto? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, guys, we're going to move this operation up the hill, and we're going to take this little stubby uh, carbine out to about 600 yards. Um, we just really wanted to kind of show you guys the ins and outs of this particular rifle. I mean, guys, just like a lot of different countries, Argentina just wanted a modernized version of what they were already using. I mean, the turn of the century was a really big point uh, for countries to arm themselves. And really, at the turn of the century, Mauser was king. I mean, you know, you look at, you know, 1898 as being a really important year. Once the Turnbolt Mauser was invented, man, the countries just fell right in and tons of different places were arming themselves with this particular rifle. It was really popular around the turn of the century. Very, very well made. Um, excellent materials that these rifles are made out of. And uh, guys, in case you don't know, I mean, some people may not know, but when it comes to these Mausers and stuff, there's a ton of different ones. I mean, not only do you have the individual models that each country might have ordered, and especially in different sequences throughout the history of the production of these Mauser rifles, but then each country, you know, had maybe a different caliber or configuration or slightly different hardware. I mean, these guns could be ordered to suit specifications of whatever country was ordering them. So that's one thing that people have to remember is that, you know, just because you're talking a Swedish Mauser versus, a, you know, an Argentine Mauser versus a, a, you know, a German contract Mauser, or you're getting into whatever different type of Mauser you're talking, they all have their slightly different intricacies about them and slightly different configurations. So this is just one tiny drop in the bucket of different Mausers that are out there. Uh, we thought it'd be fun to show off, but we're not done. Stay tuned. We're going to hop up the hill here and shoot this little guy out to uh, 600 yards. We're going to double down. So all of those shots, as I feel, were pretty, pretty much right where we wanted them to go. That's 300 yards with open sights. I mean, that's a pretty accurate little rifle for what it is, and that's, that's really nice. So we're going to move up the hill. Let's do it. All right, so we moved up to the tower. I'm going to take a few shots from uh, 611 yards with the 1909 carbine. This thing was pitting the ace earlier. Yeah. Dude. Not bad for what it is. <laughs> Not bad for a little stumpy Milser. 7.65 by 53 Argentine. Argentine. Yeah, guys, we've never shot this gun at this distance, so you're kind of learning along with us. We're just going to have some fun, see what this is all about. <laughs> and uh, there's a double whammy because I've never shot this gun in general. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, <laughs> way, to pop to learn. A, way to pop a cherry. Oh, man, you never shot that gun before? I'll just take it up the tower, shoot it 600, 600 yards. No big right. deal. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be all right. <laughs> you know, one, one thing that we have, we have found to, to be consistent with a lot of these guns, especially the Argentines, is that the, the sights seem to be pretty much right on in, in terms of elevation. You may have to set the seven in bullseye, but go ahead and lob one in and we'll see where it's at. I'm gonna lob it. Proceed. Oh, it's, yeah, it's lobbing. <laughs> Proceed to lob. The lobbery. <laughs> I'd like to report a lobbery. <laughs> they were lobbing those bullets in. They were going way over the top of the berm, hitting my house. No, I don't know about all that. <laughs> all right, whenever you're ready. Oh boy, that's tiny. Do that again. <laughs> Just uh, you, you literally hit like two inches low and right. <laughs> it's like pretty much just about spot on. What? Dude, yes. I swear. All right, now that was a foot over the gong. So whatever you, you did, just split the difference. Your okay. windage, perfect. This thing is not pleasant to shoot from the bench. Man, that thing was hitting like a freight train at 300. Impact. Dink. Three shots with a 1909 Argentine. And, and we're on the steel. Carbine. You just aiming dead on? I'm bullseye. All right, go for it, man. 
You're in there. Uh, the wind caught you, man. Left. Yeah. Dude, this camera is shaking around, or the uh, spotting scope's shaking around from the wind. I'm having a hard time it's spotting for you. Shaking around from the wind, plus the the shots kind of vibrating it a little bit too. Yep. Let's see if I can hold it still. Fun gun, regardless. I mean, dang, we hardly ever come out here and have a mill serp that's that close at six without having to monkey around with the sights a little bit. You I guys mean, are... the gun's been pretty spot on. Yep. Man, what a cool little rig. <clears throat> uh, foot over the gong, Chad. Good windage. Just right over the gong, I believe. Is that just high or just a little low? Uh, I believe it was high. Okay. Low and left, just a bit. Okay. You're right in there. Split the difference. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, low and right. You're just right ah. below the gong. Are you bullseye in the gong? Bullseye, yeah. I got set it. Set it to seven. Let's see. Yep. No in between there. Yep. All right, now that was like a foot over the gong. Are you bullseyeing? Mill serp purgatory. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> Tag gummit. What do you do then? <laughs> <laughs> it's like <laughs> you don't have a 650 meter setting or whatever, so you just, oh my gosh. Mill serp sighting purgatory. That's exactly what it is. I mean, dial back down to six and just split the gong in half and you should hit it because yeah. if you're bullseyeing it, all of your shots are hitting right along the bottom edge of that gong. So just set it to six and just aim right at it. Cut the gong in half and go. This thing only goes to 1,400 meters. No big deal. <laughs> yeah, a true marksman would shoot this gun 1,400 meters, but right. we're anything but. All right, go ahead. Enough mockery. Yeah, like right over the top of the gong. Okay. I just basically put the uh, point of the front sight in the middle of the gong. Or, well, what I perceive to be the middle, because this is <laughs> a long way. Yeah. <clears throat> well, right. That was right under it. Yep. I mean, it's throwing those bullets right, right down range, man. That might be about what it's capable of. <laughs> Impact. All right, let's see. Uh, I think you clipped the edge of the plate on the right. Impact. All right. Those two shots are like eight inches from each other that are on the plate. It's not bad. Well, I mean, that little gun's, you know, pretty accurate for what it is. I, I know we always say that for what it is. But guys, you have to understand, I mean, you're talking a hundred year old gun <laughs> with crude sights, long range. I mean, rear sight looks like it's been beat up and dressed back down with a file a couple of times. Yep. Using a firearm of questionable origin. <laughs> uh, boy, if you, you didn't miss by much.
You're right off the edge of the gong. I can't tell in which direction though. That but wind you're putting is... them right in there. Dude, no! That box, man. God, the wind is crazy. Uh, just off the right edge of the gong. Well, dang, that's where I was holding for the wind. Yeah, I guess that that caliber just don't care. <laughs> Ah, I pulled that one. That was down in the dirt. Yeah, dude. This thing is not pleasant to shoot. The recoil is starting to get to me a little bit. <laughs> Impact. All Good right, shot. One, one more for the road. Yep. Oh. <laughs> I got an ice pack down there in my cooler. I might have to go grab it. A All redneck right, ice pack. <laughs> cool. Nice. All right, 1909 Cavalry Carbine, whole wind bunch of blowing, wind. Wind blowing your junk all over the place. Yeah, oh great, wonderful day. Let's do it. Yeah, I got like four or five shots on there. It's not too bad. I didn't even see a trace. Good grief, wind. This thing's got some recoil. It's a little stout. Got it. We're gonna wait a moment. Let's see what we got. Keep except shooting. for this wind. Yeah, except for the wind, no big deal. Uh, just over the top. Good windage. Uh, same area, just over the top of the gong. You're kind of in between the target sand and the uh, the gong there. Uh, no clue. <laughs> uh, I think that was likely right over the top of the gong. Maybe. I'm getting. I'm getting that kind of right over the top of the gong vibe going. <laughs> I kind of feel that's what's going on. I'm telling you, man, Millsurp Mil sighting purgatory. Yep. Guys, these old guns are so much fun. And uh, I tell you, you know, if you were a soldier at the turn of the century and this was the gun that you had, you are pretty well armed, you know? That's back, back then, they probably, you know, they probably loved these things when they got them. Send it when you're ready. Just low. I saw a little splash off at nine o'clock there, but I couldn't tell. Maybe slightly left. Huh. Got it. Oh yeah. That was um, high and left up there off at around 11 o'clock by several inches. Got it. Couldn't see it. You got it, I can't tell where though. 
Dude, <laughs> that wind is shaking everything around up here. Good grief. Just low. Holy. I'm very um, impressed at how well this gun is shooting. And the thing is, it's like, sometimes it's not necessarily always about, let's just say, let's call it impacts. I don't know, it's a very nice shooting gun. It's just fun to shoot, even though the wind is blowing us all over the place. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing the same thing I saw when you were shooting at three was like holding the same point of aim and then rounds going high or low. Like the, the windage is perfect, just yep. about. This wind is just blowing us all over the place. <laughs> Man, I mean, guys, the wind's blowing. News flash. All right. A couple more rounds. I think you guys get the point. We just love taking these old mill serps out. They're just so much fun to shoot. And we love to show off history. Ding. That was just low and slightly left down the dirt. <clears throat> Got it. Favoring down there on the low side around seven o'clock. <laughs> Don't know. Man, I can't see anything with this thing shaking around so much. I understand. Running the same problem you did. All right, I got, only got a couple of rounds left. Ten four. All right. I feel like my shoulder's been put through a meat grinder. A <laughs> meat grinder. All right. <laughs> been tenderized. <laughs> Dude, I can't even see where the impact was. You got it. I know one thing. That round hits like a freight train down there. Yeah, it does. It better. All that powder behind it. That one was down about a foot below the gong. There All goes right. that. Last round. Weird elevation thing. Yeah, I yeah. understand. You know, honestly, there's one round left, but I might have an explanation for that. I think that that nose cap assembly puts pressure on the front of the barrel. Mm -hmm. And it, <clears throat> because the fact that that nose cap assembly is coming into contact with the barrel, it's causing the harmonics of the barrel to be off. I mean, mm, guys, let's be fair here. We're shooting 600 yards, but we're getting some impacts now. I mean, the gun is fairly consistent. So to get a little bit of, let's just say, vertical, horizontal stringing, granted, we're not shooting from a mechanical bench rest or anything like that, but looking at the performance of the gun itself, I think that the pressure from the nose cap is causing those bits of inaccuracies. If, if it is indeed the gun, that is what it is. Mm, maybe. That's, it's a that's sound my, theory. That's my theory. It's a sound theory. All right. One round to rule them all. Go for the gopher. I'm kidding. <laughs> got it. You go, the boys gong, and girls. Not the gopher. All right. Guys, thanks for watching today's video. Uh, we just want to take an old mill syrup out for you guys and show them off. These old guns are so, so neat. And uh, it's always been important to me to honor military history and to showcase military history at every chance I get because it's important to remember where, you know, a lot of your favorite guns, you know, a lot of people like these modern guns, but you have to kind of honor the old school guns too because they're the reason we have what's here today. I mean, older technology had to, to, to kind of lay the path down for all of this newer technology to follow. And yeah, it's fun to take a modern Remington 700 out and shoot, you know, six inch groups at 600 yards and everything like that. That's great. And it's, it's awesome to be able to do that. But we owe that awesomeness to guns like these.
I mean, the, these, these firearms pave the way for the modern repeater. And uh, it's just so cool to just hold history in your hands and shoot it and see that these guns deliver the goods just as good today as they did originally when they were made. And that goes to say something about German craftsmanship. And uh, I mean, the, these guns will last another hundred years as long as the barrels don't get shot out on them. So guys, thank you for watching today's video. We graciously appreciate the support uh, from all of you guys, both in the comments that you give on our channel and the suggestions you give us, as well as just watching the dang videos, which is great. Uh, we also have a Patreon. If you guys want to support us on Patreon, uh, your donations are greatly uh, appreciated. Also, we sell man cans as a way to help fund our channel. If that's something you guys are interested in doing, uh, we graciously appreciate any type of support you might be able to give. Uh, we need you guys more than ever. And for those of you that support us, we graciously appreciate all of you. Thank you for watching today's video. We'll catch you next time.